Uh, in the early part of, of the present decade, we also had uh, a much milder recession. Uh, in that recession, the U.S. suffered virtually no decline in output. Um, real GDP peaked to trough, fell 0.2 percentage points. But the recovery was very sluggish. Uh, in the six quarters, uh, uh, initial six quarters of recovery, the total growth of GDP was only 2% which is below the potential growth rate of the U.S. economy. So we had a V-shaped recession and recovery, but it was a very shallow V going in, and it was a very shallow V uh, uh, coming out. On this occasion, we're seeing a much steeper decline in output. The IMF is anticipating that we will come back relatively quickly. Nevertheless, the loss, cumulative loss of output relative to potential is larger than uh, in uh, the earlier recession. And if we did have the L-shaped recession that uh, some prognosticators forecast, then that deviation from potential would be roughly double the size uh, or more of uh, the output loss in uh, previous uh, recession. So we are certainly in a major world recession arguably the deepest uh, of uh, the post-war period. But exactly how deep is not clear yet and won't be clear until we see some significant signs that we're actually beginning to move out of uh, the recession. In this recession, one of the things which is a little bit different is that the U.S. economy began to slow much sooner than the rest of the world economy. We are, of course, familiar with the fact that this recession has involved a very sharp downturn in the housing sector in the U.S. House prices have experienced substantial declines for the first time since the 1930s. And investment in residential structures, which peaked in, at the end of 2005, was, at the end of last year, 45% below that peak. Now that includes a lot of money that's spent on repair and renovation. New home building has declined about 75% from its peak. And that decline started in 2006, proceeded through 07 and 08. But while housing in the U.S. was contracting over most of this period, there was another important factor that was offsetting it as far as the U.S economy was concerned, and that is that the net exports of the United States, the real net exports of the United States, which were in very large deficit, that deficit began to decline at the end of 2005. And indeed, in numerical terms, the $300 billion decline in real GDP in the housing sector was slightly more than offset by a $330 billion improvement in real net exports. Now, why were our real net exports improving? Well, partly the weaker dollar helped that out. Partly it was that our economy began to grow more slowly in terms of domestic demand, which means that imports were growing more slowly. At the same time, the rest of the world economy was continuing to expand quite rapidly which meant that the growth of our exports was very strong. And so for the U.S. economy, we would have had a recession already beginning in 2007 were it not for the fact that the rest of the world sort of bailed us out uh, and offset a major source of, of decline in the U.S. And that's something w w which is different uh, in this global economic uh, slowdown and downturn from what has happened in earlier. Now, another interesting feature of the present global recession is, in this country, people have been talking about recession. If you go look at Nouria Rubini, he was forecasting a catastrophic recession as early as, as, uh, uh, as 2006. And he's continued to forecast it until it seems that the forecast uh, is, is, is right. Uh, and the U.S. economy, as I noted, particularly on the demand side, was already weakening in 2007. But the rest of the world economy continued to grow quite rapidly through basically the first quarter 
of last year. And indeed, this time last year, the predominant problem in the world economy was not recession. It was overheating and inflation. The overall inflation rate for the world economy, measured by aggregate CPIs, was running up at 6%, whereas in 2003, it had been down near 3%. And commodity prices were surging upward. Indeed, the oil price continued to rise through the spring and into the summer of last year, ultimately peaking out at $147 per barrel. The Chinese economy was booming. Of course, they had the Olympics, which added to the boom. In Europe, the European Central Bank was confronting inflation of over 5% and were continuing, was continuing to tighten its monetary policy uh, until the summer of uh, uh, last year. So while the U.S. economy was slowing down and we were concerned about recession, in much of the rest of the world the concern was inflation and overheating, and policy rather than easing was in many cases uh, 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 tightening. So the world was sort of going in different directions, the U.S. versus the rest of it, until roughly the middle of uh, last year. That's when other countries around the world generally began uh, to uh, 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 slow down. And indeed, what we saw at the end of last year was the bottom fell out. Uh, this chart shows uh, industrial production and uh, the volume of trade, and those things just fell off a cliff in the fourth quarter of last year at a speed and to an extent that certainly has never been seen, not only in the post-war era, but probably even in the 1930s. While the cumulative declines in these things were much larger, there was no single quarter in which things fell that much. So this really was an extraordinary event that in such a short period of time, things deteriorated so rapidly across the entire globe. And so it wasn't just the US where the recession deepened. Japan saw its GDP decline at a 12% annual rate in the fourth quarter. Our GDP declined at a 6% annual rate uh, in uh, the fourth quarter. And pretty much all around the world, uh, growth rates fell dramatically. Now, China reported a 6.2% GDP growth rate over the quarter, four quarters previously. If we had a quarter to quarter number for China, we probably, it probably would be negative or very close to zero, which is very low uh, for the Chinese economy. So. Virtually everyone fell out of bed uh, suddenly uh, in uh, late uh, uh, last year. So the next question is, well, why did we have suddenly, on a global basis, this massive deterioration of uh, uh, economic uh, conditions? Well, undoubtedly, the turbulence in financial markets uh, had an important contributing effect on that decline. Uh, and we saw in September of uh, last year, after the failure of Lehman Brothers and the <coughs> near failure of uh, AIG in the United States, and government intervention in the UK to take over or inject substantial capital into two of their major banks, Barclays, uh, no, excuse me, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyds, and the collapse of Iceland's uh, over-exuberant banks, and other financial difficulties all concentrated in a, a relatively short period of time. Global credit markets froze, and there was a period of time in which the interbank market, the primary international interbank market, the London interbank market, basically business shut down. And European banks that needed to borrow dollars to maintain their dollar business couldn't get them from uh, uh, American banks. And the commercial paper market, 
in which large corporations borrow short term in the United States, even completely credit worthy corporations could no longer sell uh, their commercial paper. An event we've not previously seen uh, in the United States, at least there have been a day or two when things have frozen up around the time of the failure of the Penn Central Railroad, uh, but uh, nothing that has gone on for uh, weeks uh, the way this did beginning in around the middle of September and extending uh, through October and into, into November. One very interesting and relevant measure of the degree of financial turmoil, and there are a number of them, but, but this is, uh, uh, I think, the most impressive, is the so-called VIX index, the volatility index uh, measured off of uh, options on the S&P 500 uh, ETF uh, that are traded on the Chicago Board uh, Options uh, Exchange. And that volatility index tends to be high when the degree of uncertainty is high. And hence, options on the money options, both puts and calls, have quite high prices uh, for those uh, uh, options. Because people think there's a great deal of risk. The price may be either a great deal above or a great deal below where it is now. And that makes an option to buy at the current price very valuable because that way you observe, you avoid if you buy the call option, the downside, and if you buy the put option, you get protection against the downside. Now, as that chart shows, during a period of relative quiescence in the, two, uh, in the, the 2000 period, when interest rate spreads and other measures of volatility were quite low, the volatility index was generally a little above 10, around 15. At the time and of the Lehman Brothers AIG uh, uh, crisis uh, and for a few weeks thereafter, well, the volatility index hit 90. Now that's something like 10 standard deviations above the mean. <laughs> that's an event we have never seen before. And if you look at the sort of standard volatility measures, we would have expected on normal volatility grounds to have seen that approximately once since the last ice age. Uh, so <laughs> this is really an extraordinary event and is an indication of the sudden onset of extraordinary turbulence in uh, a financial market. Now volatility has come down and recently the volatility index has been trading between 40 and 50, which is still very highly escalated relative to any previous period. Previous peaks in the volatility index, if we push it back another decade, are generally in the range of 30 or 35. So we are still above the, the peaks in the previous uh, periods. And that volatility, uncertainty, and freezing up of uh, capital markets, credit markets, had an immediate and serious impact on economic activity. When businesses cannot get short-term credit, which they need in order to make their normal flow of payments, they begin to cut back on their inventory, cut back on their activities, and so forth, in order to conserve uh, on uh, cash. So it doesn't take very long when you have this type of, of turbulence uh, for the economy to feel its effect. I described in one TV interview, I said, this is the financial equivalent of ventricular fibrillation, where the heart suddenly flutters and doesn't pump any blood. In a few seconds, you're unconscious. In a couple of minutes, you suffer irreversible brain damage, and in 10 minutes, you're dead. Well, uh, it was that type of disturbance in the credit markets that was very rapidly uh, causing a, a sharp deterioration in economic uh, conditions. But that was not all. I think we were also seeing the delayed effect of the upsurge in oil prices, which impacted negatively econ oil importing economies all around 
the world. It took, as it usually do, did, a month or two before the effect was felt. And as oil prices fell, the consuming countries didn't immediately respond to the positive development, but the exporting countries were hit on uh, the negative side. In addition to that, economic policy was beginning to have a negative impact on growth. The tightening that had been undertaken in Europe and Japan and so forth to combat inflation earlier in the year was finally beginning to have its impact by the time we reached uh, year end. Similarly, the Chinese uh, tightening uh, to uh, control the upsurge there, which they had begun to undertake in early 2008, uh, was beginning to have its impact by the end of the year. And the Bush tax cuts of 2008, which had helped to boost demand during the second quarter and a bit during the third quarter, their effect wore off and effectively became negative in the fourth quarter. So we added a negative impulse from uh, economic policy to the negative impulse from the surge uh, in commodity prices and its collapse on top of this extraordinary uh, financial market turbulence. And uh, the result. was that. Um, so uh, it was a complex event, and it was a worldwide series of factors, not just turbulence in the United States, uh, but financial turbulence in many other credit markets, plus, as I say, the commodity prices and the delayed effects of policy tightening and so forth, produced this sort of unique uh, slowdown, downturn in world economic trade and, and the manufactured goods production. Well, that's the downturn. Um, what can we anticipate about uh, economic recovery, both in the US uh, and in the rest of the world? Well, I think we should anticipate that there will be an economic recovery. The question is, what will it look like? Uh, and I tend to be of the, uh, the V-shaped view. Uh, 27 years ago, when I started to forecast the U.S. economy uh, on a more formal basis, I went to my colleague, Victor Zarnowitz, who died just about 10 days ago. Uh, Victor was a great student of the business cycle uh, and of business cycle forecasting, though he was not himself a daring forecaster. And uh, so I got Victor's analysis and advice, and he said, well, economists have never found a way to forecast recessions, when they will occur or how deep they will go. And they find it very difficult to forecast when the recovery will start. There is, in fact, only one regularity in macroeconomic behavior that, that forecasters can reasonably rely on. Deep recessions are followed by steep recovery. <laughs> That's the way it always works. And in the last roughly century for which we have business cycle data in the United States, which we can compare more or less with, with uh, recent data, uh, last 60 years we have quarterly data on GDP, but we can extend it backward using the industrial production series. There is, in fact, only one recession out of 15, 16, which is L-shaped. And that was the great, glorious, happy recession between 1944, late 1944 and 1946. Real GDP in the United States fell 14% because federal spending on the war declined from 42% of GDP to 9% of GDP for total of federal spending. And an enormous boom in private consumption and private investment was not quite enough to offset the enormous cut uh, in uh, defense spending. And besides, people had been working like hell in order to win the war, and they didn't want to work so hard, so uh, output uh, fell. And the recovery after the, the drop in output was only at a 4% uh, annual rate. So it looked L-shaped. That's the only one that looks uh, uh, L-shaped. All the others, especially when you have a steep recession, including the Great Depression of the 1930s, you get a steep 
cover. Now, you know, Moses did not receive a golden tablet on which was engraved the principle that you must always get uh, a steep uh, recovery. Uh, but um, <laughs> uh, that has been uh, the rule. Now, I have a, a forecast for the U.S. economy, and I've distributed in, in uh, your handouts uh, my forecast of the present recession, which is the bottom line in that table, uh, in comparison with what has happened in previous recessions. And my forecast is that the U.S. economy is probably going to hit bottom around the middle of this year. And we will get negative GDP growth in the current quarter, the second quarter. But we will turn to positive GDP growth in the summer, with the cyclical trough on a monthly basis, perhaps occurring in June, perhaps occurring in July, uh, either the late spring or the early part of the summer. Now, there are many forecasters who think the recession will go on longer until the end of the summer or even into uh, the fall. But of the 50 forecasters in the blue chip uh, uh, publication who are serious responsible forecasters, 40 of them expect that the recovery will begin uh, by the fall uh, at uh, the latest. Uh, and only three of them put the recovery date beginning in Uh, and the question is, well, if we get a recovery, how robust will it be? Uh, and the view I have here is, you know, we've really beat down the housing sector a lot. And we beat down housing prices a lot, too. They're still falling. I think by the middle of this year, I mean, they're already now down on the Case-Shiller Index and, and one other index to where they were in 2003, and they're still falling. I think we'll get them down to a level at which people should be saying, well, maybe now is the time to buy. Uh, and there's a long way for residential investment to come back, especially given the drop in uh, mortgage uh, interest rates. Uh, the automobile industry, I mean, we beat down auto sales from 16 million a year, uh, not only last year, but on average for the past decade, uh, down to about 9 million. Uh, and uh, I think that consumer spending will probably hit bottom if it hasn't already. And by the fall, we can see auto sales rising. Even if we get back to 11 million this year, we've got to have enough of a rebound in the second half of the year that it will be have a measurable effect on uh, GDP. And inventory investment, which has gone negative, always turns around and goes positive. The normal pattern of adjustment in a business cycle is that in the first six quarters of business cycle recovery, on average in all post-war U.S. recessions, real GDP has advanced 7.7%. Not at an annual rate, 7.7% cumulatively over uh, six uh, uh, quarters. And aside from, from the 2001 recession and its recovery and the 1948-49 recession, uh, which are outliers, one on the upside and one on the downside. We also have this 7.7% rate of uh, GDP uh, gain. I think we won't do quite that well. That It'll be more like 6% uh, recovery. But that's about double uh, what most forecasters are assuming uh, concerning the pace of recovery uh, coming out of the recession. Indeed, even the Obama administration is a little below me in terms of what they're forecasting for economic recovery. But I am below the average of past recoveries uh, at 6% as opposed to 7.7% uh, for these first uh, six quarters. In any event, we shall see. Finally, I want to say a few words about uh, economic policy issues going forward. And here I don't mean the extended economic stimulus and so forth. That has to do with you know, what we're doing to combat the recession. We've got in the United States a substantial amount of fiscal stimulus, which is coming online, uh, some of it by the summer and most of it by the fall and, and later. And the Federal Reserve has been just pumping in enormous amounts of liquidity uh, into uh, the system. So I think on the policy side, we're getting a lot of support uh, for the recovery. Uh, and other countries, uh, the Chinese have a very large fiscal stimulus program. 
uh, and several other countries as well. Some are doing somewhat less, but policy is undoubtedly weighing heavily uh, in the direction of ending the recession and promoting recovery. And in the past, when we've done that, it has certainly helped uh, in the Reagan recovery of uh, uh, 84, 85. Uh, the combination of the big Reagan tax cuts and the defense buildup propelled the economy up uh, by over 10 percentage points in uh, six uh, quarters. I don't think we'll see that this time, but I believe the policy stimulus will help to produce a 6% recovery uh, at least. Perhaps most of the rest of the world uh, will lag somewhat behind us. Uh, China may well have a quarter or two lead on us. Uh, there are some indications that its economy is already beginning to pick up some steam after uh, what was clearly uh, a very uh, sluggish uh, fourth uh, uh, quarter. Well, what about these policy issues? And let me mention briefly uh, two main areas. One area are traditional macroeconomic policies. And the question here is, how will we or will we be able to avoid a resurgence of inflation as we come out of the present difficulty? Uh, because we are pumping in an enormous amount of liquidity uh, through non-traditional means. And the Federal Reserve really doesn't have much experience with turning it around, which leaves us somewhat up in the air as to whether they'll be able to do it successfully or whether inflation will get a bit out of hand before they're able to rein things back in, or if they rein them in too quickly, whether that might slow the economy again. Uh, my own view is I think the Fed will probably manage it fairly well but I would worry that, that, that looking out beyond 2010, that there is some concern that inflation uh, may uh, uh, pick up some. The other, I think, macroeconomic concern, which people have discussed much, is the question of uh, will we, are we in the process of building the basis for a new bubble as we come out of the present recession? Uh, just as some have argued that the extremely easy stance of monetary policy in the United States and elsewhere uh, coming out of the 2001 recession helped build up the credit market bubble uh, that uh, we are seeing unwind in uh, present uh, circumstances. I think no one has a good answer to uh, that uh, uh, question. Uh, and uh, so far, I would say there's no consensus about uh, how to uh, avoid that. Finally, there is a question of strengthening uh, regulation of the financial sector in order to at least limit the risk of the types of excesses that we saw in the U.S. financial system and also in the financial systems in other uh, advanced uh, economies. It wasn't just us with the subprime mortgages and the rest of it. European banks were lending a lot of money to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, which looks like it's going to be a consider considerable problem. The British and Irish banks were funding their own real estate boom. Uh, it's uh, not just the U.S. Uh, and there are a lot of proposals out there to strengthen regulation uh, over the uh, financial system. Uh, my view is that there is one principal reform that is needed above all others. And one of the few points where I agree with some of Alan Greenspan's recent pronouncements is that it's very difficult both for bank managers and for bank regulators and supervisors to accurately foresee a number of the risks that might befall them. The solution to the problem, therefore, is for banks and other financial institutions to hold much more capital than has been the case in recent years. You go back to the old national banking system before the Federal Reserve, banks were holding equity capital 25% of their uh, total uh, uh, assets. I think we need to get those capital ratios at least double to triple uh, what they have been. And that's a reasonable proposal for uh, two key reasons. One, if we applied mark-to-market accounting comprehensively to the balance sheets of depository institutions over the last 40 years, we would have found that major banks in this country were insolvent 
in the mid-1970s, insolvent in the early 1980s, and at least a number of them insolvent in the early 1990s. That fact was disguised because we didn't mark bank assets to market. We carried them at book. But if we had marked them to market, we would have found that they actually had negative capital in these episodes. Negative capital is not a good thing. In order to avoid, if it was a once in a century outcome, I wouldn't worry about it, which is sort of what Alan Greenspan's view is. But it seems to me it's more like once a decade, and that's too much. So I think banks and other similar type institutions have enough, need to have enough capital so that in a recession it doesn't go negative if you actually value their assets at some reasonable estimate of what they could uh, uh, sell for uh, in stressful market conditions. Not only that, that this is not an issue like how high do you need to build a levy around New Orleans. Because you build a levy high enough that keeps out the storm, and then the storm goes away and the levy is still there. The problem with bank capital is much more like the problem of protecting against nuclear war. It's your second strike capability that really matters. Right? The banks have to have enough capital so that when large amounts of capital get wiped out during a period of recession and financial stress, they have enough left over to continue to operate reasonably normally, even in circumstances where the economy and financial system remain under considerable stress. So you need to basically figure out how much capital they need potentially to absorb the losses, and then multiply that by two. Uh, that's the number that uh, is needed uh, in order to have adequate capital to absorb the shock and still be in business. Uh, uh, afterwards. It remains to be seen whether the push for reform will move us significantly in, in the direction. But if you can't manage the risks that successfully, if, you know, fundamentally the Staten Island theory is not made for transatlantic voyages, uh, and you can't rely on uh, superior performance of the crew and the Coast Guard uh, to keep it afloat if you put it in that kind of business. You need to build a much safer ship uh, for that kind of service. Uh, and I think that's primarily what we need in the financial sector.